From orbit, and with the help of many landers and rovers, Mars's rocky topography has been mapped and photographed in more detail than any other rocky planet in the solar system. Even Mercury has been mapped and imaged to a respectable degree. But there aren't many pictures of Venus's surface, and none have been taken in more than 40 years. Venus is a difficult planet to take pictures of, so this is more than simply space agencies being lazy. It's not easy in the world next door, where scorching heat and intense pressure may rapidly destroy any lander. Only four Soviet Venera probes were able to photograph Venus's surface between 1975 and 1982. Something has been spotted in recently declassified photographs of Venus, and scientists are understandably worried. What are the panoramic photos of Venus that astronomers found to be both peculiar and alien? Join us as we explore declassified images of Venus by the Soviet Union and how it's changing everything we know. Carl Sagan once said that Venus is the planet in our solar system, most like hell. So when are we going back? Phosphine was recently discovered by astronomers to exist in acidic clouds on Venus and was regarded as possible evidence of life. This has piqued the interest of some astronomers in revisiting Venus, the Sun's second planet, who believe it has been unfairly neglected in favor of Mars and other destinations. It's not simple to get to Venus. Its surface averages 800 degrees Fahrenheit and its atmosphere, rich in carbon dioxide, is 90 times as dense as Earth's. Some submarines can't handle the surface pressure there. Despite this, human space programs have continued to try. The governments of Earth have launched roughly 40 robotic spacecraft to Venus. This article highlights highlights from past journeys to Venus and discusses the chances of a quick return to the planet to finally figure out what the heck is going on up there in the clouds. The Soviet space program first attempted to visit Venus in 1961. Over the succeeding decades, it launched scores of probes at the planet, sometimes referred to as Earth's twin. Despite early Soviet investigation of Venus being fraught with failure, the Soviets eventually landed a spacecraft on Venus and took the first photographs from the surface of another planet. Their engineering feats were remarkable even by today's standards. The enormous pressure on Venus was first made clear to the Soviets when their first spacecraft entered the atmosphere and promptly exploded into a million pieces. Through a process of trial and error, Five-ton metal spaceships were eventually constructed to survive the tremendous surface pressures for at least an hour. In 1967, Venera 4 made history as the first spacecraft to take readings of another planet's atmosphere. It found that Venus's constant greenhouse effect is caused by a high concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Then, in 1975, the Soviet Union's Venera 9 mission snapped the first ever pictures from another planet's surface. Venus was formally introduced to the world. Images sent back by it and subsequent trips showed a world unlike any other, with fractured terrain bathed in diluted neon green light. The watery, Earth-like world we imagined was actually a foreign planet with deadly rain. Scientists gained a deeper knowledge of the Earth's geological processes thanks to data gathered by later Venera missions that continued into the 1980s. As they approached the surface, Venera 11 and 12 picked up on a great deal of lightning and thunder. As the first spacecraft to record audio from another planet, Venera 13 and 14 were outfitted with microphones that recorded the sounds of their descent to the surface. With the completion of the twin Vega spacecraft's Venus encounters in 1985, the Soviet Union demonstrated the feasibility of probes that could float in the planet's clouds by releasing enormous balloons equipped with scientific gear. Launches to Venus ceased as the Soviet space program slowed down during the Cold War's conclusion. Although the Russian space program has discussed future Venus exploration, no concrete plans have been implemented. Even NASA maintained its focus on Venus. Even though Mars has always taken precedence in the minds of American space planners, Venus was nonetheless included in the Mariner and Pioneer missions of the 1960s and 1970s. In 1962, the United States sent a spacecraft called Mariner 2 to the planet Venus. It found that the surface was incredibly hot, but that temperatures were much lower in the clouds. American scientists finally got a good look in 1978 thanks to the Pioneer missions. 
The first of the two completed an orbit of Venus that lasted nearly 14 years and shed light on the planet's strange atmosphere. It found that Venus's surface was smoother than Earth's and that the planet had a weak magnetic field, if any at all. The second Pioneer mission launched many probes into Venus's atmosphere, gathering data on the cloud cover and surface composition. In 1990, NASA launched a spacecraft called Magellan, which mapped the Earth for four years while searching for signs of plate tectonics. Old lava flows were found to cover around 90% of the land, suggesting frequent volcanic activity in the area's recent and distant history. Although many NASA spacecraft have used Venus as a slingshot on their way to other planets, this one was the last American visitor. In 2005, the European Space Agency sent Venus Express into space. After eight years of orbit, it found evidence that the planet was likely still experiencing some level of geological activity. Japan launched Akatsuki in 2010, making it the only Earth visitor to the planet so far. The probe's engine didn't start as it was entering orbit around Venus. Thus, it missed its scheduled meeting with the planet. By 2015, the mission's planners had successfully guided it into orbit around the planet for in-depth scientific investigation. Since then, scientists' perception of our clouded sibling has shifted drastically. The mission discovered equatorial jet streams and gravity waves in Venus's atmosphere while studying the mechanics of the planet's dense cloud layers. Today's view of Venus does not provide a picture of a friendly environment. It appears like the worst possible place for life to develop, with surface temperatures hotter than an oven, air pressure similar to being 3,000 feet below in the ocean, and no liquid water anywhere that we can see. Scientists have just recently begun to question whether or not this hell planet was ever actually inhabited. Venus may have had oceans similar to Earth's billions of years ago when it was cooler and wetter. It's plausible that Venus may have supported life in the distant past, but something went terribly wrong. Venus and Earth once had many similarities despite their vast differences now. Each planet is about the same size as the other, and they both formed from the same raw ingredients at the dawn of the solar system. They are both below the snow line, the outer limit of the region of the solar system, below which water freezes into solid ice crystals. Although Venus is closer to the Sun and thus receives more heat, it is less dense than Earth and rotates more slowly. The early histories of the two planets may have been quite similar, so it's feasible, though debated, that ancient Venus had water oceans. Examples include a 2016 study by NASA planetary scientists that used climate simulations to determine that had oceans existed on Venus in the past, the planet might have maintained steady temperatures between 68 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit for roughly 3 billion years. These models, however, hinged on the existence of water on the planet, which is questionable. Scientists believe that Venus was not habitable regardless of the presence or absence of water. Venus reached what is known as a runaway greenhouse phase, marking a significant departure from Earth's climate. Surface water evaporated as temperatures rose, creating water vapor in the atmosphere that was subsequently divided by sunlight into oxygen and hydrogen and eventually lost to space. The accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere led to a further rise in temperature. That's why everyone believes Venus descended into the abyss it is now. The atmosphere wasn't the only thing hit by these alterations. The tectonics of a planet are also influenced by atmospheric changes. Since the surface of the globe is heating up more quickly than its core, internal material mobility is decreasing. In addition, climate stability is expected to be facilitated by active tectonics, as is the case on Earth. Reduced tectonic activity may make Earth less habitable by making water recycling more difficult. We can confirm that Venus has become significantly warmer. The water loss is a fact. Walter Kiefer, a tectonics researcher from the Lunar and Planetary Institute, said, those known losses will change the tectonics. As Kiefer put it, it's a chicken and egg question. The altered climate might have been produced by a tectonic event that occurred before or after the climatic shift. Kiefer remarked, we've got to think of Venus as a system when trying to comprehend the planet's history. How was the weather exactly? What was happening with the atmosphere? And how was it being affected by the outgassing? Which came first, 
the evolution of the atmosphere or the evolution of the tectonics, or perhaps a combination of the two. When discussing habitability, it is helpful to define our terms precisely, because it's likely that when you hear the word habitable, you immediately think of things like the planet's temperature, the level of radiation, and the amount of oxygen in the air. However, in the context of planetary science, the phrase has a narrower meaning. Its sole meaning is a planet where liquid water can be found at surface temperatures between 32 and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Everything from the strength of the planet's magnetic field to the size of the planet to the presence of a moon can alter this. A habitable planet's optimal conditions are difficult to predict because of the wide variety of factors that can affect average surface temperatures. The necessary timescales make it unlikely that Venus was ever truly livable, even if conditions were ideal and the planet did reach the necessary surface temperatures at some point in its history. The emergence of anything resembling life is a slow and laborious process. The key to habitability is not only reaching the temperature required for liquid water on the surface, but also keeping it there, and the hardest part is keeping it up over time. The precise amount of time needed for a stable surface temperature is dependent on the complexity of the life you're considering, but it's safe to say that it's on the order of billions of years. Such an event occurred on Earth, where surface temperatures are kept constant by mechanisms such as plate tectonics. However, we have no idea how frequently that occurs. Perhaps most rocky planets are similar to Earth in that they, too, have plate tectonics or other mechanisms that maintain temperatures within the necessary range for extended periods of time. Or maybe most rocky planets are more similar to Venus, in which case Earth-like environments are extremely rare. It's possible that Earth is nothing more than a cosmic fluke. Given the lack of evidence for habitability on Venus in the past, you might be wondering why it matters. The chances of there being life on the planet currently are extremely remote, even if there was a brief window when it might have been habitable. There is some speculation that bacteria could exist in the atmosphere of Venus. However, the evidence for this is shaky at best. Venus, however, is not simply significant in and of itself. It's a microcosm of the other worlds in our galaxy too. Since Venus can tell us so much about what other planets and other systems might be like, it attracts the attention of many planetary scientists. While we can't travel to those planets, we can get up close and personal with Venus. Understanding the planets in our own solar system is a prerequisite to learning about and identifying possibly habitable exoplanets. The difficulty of inferring an exoplanet's environment is high. It's a huge obstacle, Kane admitted. Because it is an inference, we're not going there. We're not landing on the surface of an exoplanet, they explain, so the inference comes from a model. This model is developed using information from our own solar system. If we can't get it right for a planet in our solar system, we certainly won't be able to do so for one in another solar system, he said. In contrast, if Venus was formerly suitable for human habitation, a wide variety of exoplanets would suddenly become candidates for such a status. Kane believes it's quite significant if Venus did have a significant habitable era. This could be a natural condition for rocky planets at a certain distance from their stars, where the water cycle's feedback loops push in the direction of liquid water on the surface. And that would tell us a lot about whether or not we can expect those kinds of conditions elsewhere. There have been numerous proposals for returning to Venus, and some space organizations have even publicly stated their desire to do so but it's tough to say how many will actually show up. The Indian Space Research Organization has suggested a mission called Shukrayaan-1, which will study the atmosphere from orbit. Rocket Lab is a private New Zealand company that has already sent around a dozen rockets into space, and its founder, Peter Beck, has recently discussed the possibility of bringing a small satellite to Earth. Two plans for sending humans to Venus were among the 2017 finalists for NASA's Discovery Program, which has already flown humans to the Moon, Mars, Mercury, and other places. Instead, two asteroid missions were chosen by the agency. In 2017, NASA also evaluated a Venus mission named Venus in situ composition investigations, or VICI, which aimed to place two landers on the planet's surface for the larger, more expensive New Frontiers competition. Instead, the Dragonfly project was approved. 
which plans to launch a plutonium-powered drone to Saturn's largest moon, Titan. However, NASA did provide funding for certain of Vici's necessary technology, and there may be a new NASA supporter for the Venus cause. In the next Discovery Program round, NASA will have the option of selecting a Venus mission for financing. Missions to Jupiter's volcanic moon Io and Neptune's moon Triton compete with the two Venus spacecraft Da Vinci Plus and Veritas. The Venera missions were very successful, but they weren't the last time we'd view Venus. The launch of NASA's Da Vinci mission is scheduled for 2029, with landing following in 2031. It will capture high-resolution photos of the ground and conduct atmospheric research. We've been waiting for new photographs of Venus's surface for 50 years. Maybe NASA won't prolong this mission like they did with Veritas. There is also the possibility of further opportunities for Venus tourists. There is a lot we don't know about Venus's past, but we're about to find out. New atmospheric and topographical data on Venus will shed light on the planet's past as three missions are scheduled to investigate the planet over the next decade. Scientists can determine whether Venus lost considerable amounts of water over time by analyzing parameters like the ratio of hydrogen to one of its isotopes, deuterium, in the Venusian atmosphere. They can also discover how noble gases are being lost to space via solar winds by monitoring their abundance. More data on the planet's volcanic activity and its innards will be uncovered by other components of the forthcoming expeditions. With the information gained from these three missions, we will be one step closer to comprehending our neighboring planet's profound beauty and hellishness. We're rapidly approaching the Venusian decade. NASA and the European Space Agency have three prospective Venus missions planned, so we're on the edge of learning more than ever before about our nearest planetary neighbor. But the lessons won't be limited to the study of planets. Aerobraking is a new technology that will be used by two missions, and vision of the European Space Agency and Veritas of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to get their spacecraft into the appropriate orbit for them to accomplish their work. Normally, you would use fuel to slow down a spacecraft in the same manner you would speed it up. Both the launch from your home planet and the orbital injection at your destination require the use of chemical propulsion, which is a terrific way to generate a lot of force very quickly. However, Gasoline also has a significant weight. When it comes to rocket launches, every ounce counts in terms of cost. Cost and space for scientific equipment are both affected by the amount of fuel a spaceship carries. Therefore, aerospace experts have spent the previous few decades perfecting a method to reduce a spacecraft's velocity. This innovative approach eliminates the need to burn fuel by making use of the air present in the vast majority of potential travel destinations. The spaceship dips into the upper atmosphere, where friction slows its speed slightly. After dipping in, the spacecraft rises again, slowing its velocity and reducing its orbit. Aerobraking is a technique utilized by spacecraft on Mars and has been tested for use on returning spacecraft. However, the technology is now being considered for use on two forthcoming Venus missions. Aerobraking has been utilized by two earlier Venus spacecraft Magellan and Venus Express, after their primary science objectives had been fulfilled and the scientists sought to experiment with the technique. Aerobraking has never before been used by a spacecraft at the outset of a mission, but Envision and Veritas will be the first to do so. It's definitely something to look forward to, don't you agree? Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.